Welcome to the STS Conference 2017 in Houston. My name is Joel Dunning and I'm delighted to be with two experts in pectus surgery. Uh, Dawn Jarolewski, uh, you're a, a professor of thoracic surgery at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona uh, and a world expert in pectus surgery. And uh, Dan, uh, Dan Miller, you're chief of thoracic surgery at the Wellstar and a clinical professor at the Medical University Hospital in Georgia and a world expert in all of thoracic surgery and taught us so much uh, in terms of VATS uh, and, and I absolutely love both of your videos and I've learned so much from you both. Um, perhaps Dawn I'd like to start with yourself. Uh, first of all we'll, we'll talk about uh, a pectus excavatum and we'll talk about the NUS procedure which is probably you know, our most common way of, of repairing these but, but who are the patients that we should be operating on? How do you select people uh, and what are the benefits of this operation? Well, I mean, I, the main problem with the excavatum is the cosmetic aspect, but also the fact that the concavity of the chest can create compression on the heart. And that, I, I do a lot of adults, and most of those patients come to see me in their 30s and 40s because of symptoms, because of progression, that um, they're short of breath. And so I think any patient that has heart compression should be, from, from a medical standpoint, operated on. But I also think there's a huge component of um, mental distress over the cosmesis. And I, we, I actually had a patient, a kid that I saw that before we repaired him, took a shotgun to his chest and you know, everybody was bullying him and you know, he was um, distressed. So I mean, I think it's a huge, huge issue. And I, I, I'm very pro fixing these patients. Yeah, absolutely. And Dan, how do you select patients? Well, I, I think what Don says, it, it's if you look at the whole spectrum, because we do, you know, young adults or older adults. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of education in regards to the parents, also in regards to the patient, what it's going to look like afterwards. But the most important thing that we're relieving is the compression of the heart and their ability not to keep up with other people and their daily activities. But I think the big thing, it is a cosmetic thing. Every day, they take their shirt off, they see that. And it started in junior high, high school, where people would you know, say things to them and so forth. So that's why I think it's, it's very important that we also have to spend a lot of time with the patient before and after, because we these it's almost like a, a cancer patient. You're gonna see them for a number of years after their surgery. And just to talk to them about things and how things are going and sometimes they need other procedures or plastic surgery you know issues and so forth so it's not just one thing fixed and they're out of the system they're going to be with you for a while and and, and i think that's the most important thing and dawn obviously we, we do understand deeply the sort of psychological aspect of it but i think um sometimes the cardiovascular impairments underappreciated these fit 18 year olds that get an echo it's normal the lung function's normal you know some physicians don't appreciate the, the significance how do you test to really demonstrate that there is impairment so we do, we do get regular transthoracic echocardiograms on all the patients, more, from my standpoint, more so to make sure they don't have any other issues because you can have you know, connective tissue association with valvular disease and whatnot. But the, I think you know, we were talking earlier, probably the best test is the cardiopulmonary exercise, the, the VO2. And you see that. I mean, it makes sense when, when you need increased cardiac output when you're exercising you have two mecha mechanisms, it's the heart beats faster and then the volume is increased. And in the pectus patient, because of the restriction of the right ventricle, you can't get that increase in your volume flow. And you see that on the curves. I mean, they do find when they start, but once you get to the endurance, once you get to pushing to the edge, they fall off the normal curve. And, and their peak anaerobic VO2 is very commonly not normal. It's you know, extremely, it can be extremely low. And from an insurance standpoint, that's been critical in, in my ability to, to get insurance companies because it, they'll be like, oh, I mean, the patient comes in and their, their scan is impressive. I mean, I had one guy that had literally 0.4 centimeter be between his spine and his, I mean, it was literally pinched and you could see the vein, pulmonary veins going across and you're like, my God, how does this person? And the insurance company denied it. And it's like, this is this is not cosmetic, you know. So that's been really important in, in trying to you know show they have a deficit. It is in fact affecting them. Well, I think what's so important about it that as you work these people up, there has to be a team, or if you're pulmonologist, your cardiologist, and so forth, because you want someone to know what they're looking for. 
you, if they just get their echo on the outside, and they don't really say anything about the right ventricle, tricuspid regurge, and so forth. So you've really got to get a team, and that's why I think it's very important as we do large volumes of this, that's very important for the patient, also you know, for coverage from the insurance company. Yeah, so, so let's move on to the actual technical aspects of the operation. I think uh, you know, they can be done well and they can be done badly. And I think uh, you know, I'm sure you've both seen quite a lot of uh, patients referred to you know, haven't had a good out outcome. So what's the absolute best way to do a NUS procedure? There's a debate about the length of the bar, about how many bars, about whether to lift the sternum. I mean, what would you advise surgeons uh, who are low in there? Yes, doctor. <laughs> well, I, I, I think that, that's a big, that's a big uh, fighting ground. You know, when I trained, I trained Ravage. I, I mean, I never saw or ever did a NUS, and it was actually patients that were asking me, why can't you do this with a NUS? And I'm like, oh, well, you can, and you can only do it in kids. And after a while, I was like, well, why can't you? And so I, I think there are, are stages. There's, there's levels of how deep they are. There's age of patients. I mean, I, I did a 70-year-old patient mm -hmm. that was flexible. You know, and I've done 20-year-olds that are, are like rock. And yeah. so I think every patient is different and it's not based on age. You know, there's two things. Number one, it has to be safe. So mm -hmm. I think um, you absolutely have to use a camera. There's still people that put the bars in blindly. And you know, yeah. just because you haven't perforated a heart doesn't mean you're not going to. I think uh, I like elevation because it's very difficult to get under a deep defect and I think that makes it safer. Yeah, especially for an asymmet severely asymmetric patient. And that's where a lot of these people who don't use the camera, they get into issues yeah. hitting the heart. So, so elevation is, is I think elevation is important. Yeah. And then, you know, how long your bars are, how short, how you secure them. There, there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, the bars can't move and, you know, they, and they have to stay anterior. And all, almost all the redos, we're actually giving a talk on the redo nest, but what, what you see is the bars are either placed too lateral or they've ripped lateral and the, the bar is literally skewering across the chest. It's not even against the sternum. Mm -hmm. That's probably the most common mistake. And so the, they are difficult cases to do. And I think that that's, you know, that is where um, some of the, the controversy on NUS has, has been because of complications that were technical related. Yeah, and if you allow it to strip down through the intercostal spaces, that's when it dips exactly. down. And I suppose your tip of lifting the sternum really helps with that as well. It does, it does take but, some uh, pressure. I was, I was interested in your technique because I, I always thought the stabilizer plate would prevent the stripping, but actually you don't use stabilizer plates anymore. I don't, you know, and, um, you know, Park does that medial stabilizer too, just like um, Pilagar does, and, and, and that's a, that is a, a great way to do it. Um, I actually take a fiber wire and we'll reinforce the inner space, you know, the rib above, rib below, and put a fiber wire now on each side. And so the bar is resting on that. And that I think works better. I used to do it like in redos and really mm -hmm. big guys. Now I just do it on everybody because it doesn't take that much long. And that way you know for sure that bar is not going to strip out. Yeah, because a stabilizing bar, the big thing you, you look at, especially if they've, not that we've done it, but they've had it done at a younger age and they come back three, four, sometimes they, they get lost in the system. Me taking that stabilizing bar out, it's hard. ossifies into the ribs and so forth, and then afterwards they can have a, a pretty good little depression right there, some and pain. So, getting away from the stabilizing bar, I think, is, makes a big difference, especially when you have to remove it. I think that's the biggest negative of the stabilizer here is that what I've seen is sometimes it'll compress, you know, depress the ribs in, and especially on the really thin guys, you know, they, they kind of have that divot right underneath their their um, nipple, and some of them really are unhappy with that. And also too, you have to kind of look, you're talking about a nurse for a patient, is what is their career on down the road? In, in Georgia, we have a lot of military bases. So I get these young army men who are at Fort Benning or, or wherever, and they're going through their maneuvers and they can't keep up. So when they come up, you can't give them a nurse because they're gonna be deployed, you know, within the air, they can't have anything metal in their chest. So then we, you know, we talk about them about, you know, about different things, a minimally invasive nurse with a, uh, biological bar or doing a ravage, but you really got to look at the patient totally, you know, especially if they're going to move to Europe or, or, or whatever, be in the military is a big thing. Yeah, I mean, you've had some experience with the bioabsorbable NUS bar, which I've never sort of used. I mean, tell us about that. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's a bar that's absorbable. It was made for rib fractures, and we've kind of expanded it into the chest. And uh, we've done a minimally invasive AVATS technique. And uh, so basically, it's like a ball construed technique. And 
we'll do that. We'll do the elevation first, which is the key to, to lift up. And then we'll do two small incisions on each side. We can go underneath. We have a thoroscopic rib cutter and we'll take out the center portion of the cartilage, usually three through seven or, or four through seven. And then, so that allows everything to come up. And then we'll, the bio bridge is about 11 centimeters long. We usually put four to five bars together. And then what's nice about it, you can put it in a water bath and then it will, you can, it will soften up and you can make it, you know, to look like a Lorenz bar. And then we, we put it underneath, we secure it on the sides, and we never have to remove that. Now, we've done it in people who are very small, you know, we're not going for the bodybuilder, because some of our patients will try to make their pectus better. They come with the largest pecs we've ever seen in their life, but they still have, a, you know, a very deep pectus. So it's a very select group of people to do that. So. And, and Dawn, is, is the NUS appropriate for asymmetrical patients that sort of uh, dip to the side? So, it depends. Mm -hmm. there, there is a certain amount of asymmetry that you can correct. Um, you can actually, it, it's, it's not a true sandwich technique where you put a bar on top, but you can actually use a fiber wire to wrap and, and pull the one side down to the bar if they're flexible enough. And then there are some patients that there's absolutely no way. Um, there's also some that are rigid enough or that have the arcuate where they hump out of the top where you're not going to fix that without taking out some of that calcified bad cartilage and so you know there's a lot of different ways I, I do what I call hybrid where I do like a little mini ravage on the area that's calcified and then I put bars in just like I would a regular NUS but you know I think it, it's every patient's so different and I think that's where experience is important because you know you realize that okay this I can fix this and, I can, or, and I'm not going to be able to fix this. And I think that's in the preoperative uh, at last, I think the last uh, almost 10 years now, we've used 3D reconstruction CT. You know, we look at the Haller index, but when you look at these complex things, and especially the asymmetric patient, you're going to say, well, I'm going to have to do something to three and four over here or, or just to fix things, because you don't want to create, to fix their pectus excavatum to have a carinotum or that, whether they have an issue with that. So it is, it's like, it's fine tuning, but the 3D reconstruction, and the patients love to see it. They, they loved it, oh, this is incredible. And then, you know, we repeated it six months and an echo, pulmonary function test, and just to prove that, you know, things are better. And there, you know, there can be some modifications, but that preoperative 3D really works out very well. well. It's expectations too. I mean, I think yeah. it's really good to, you know, when the patients have the right expectations of, of what you're gonna do and what, what they're gonna, the results are gonna be is also very important. So if we move on to sort of more the, the carinatum type group of people or the very severe asymmetrical patients, you know, there is a place for ravage. You know, there's, there's I think Dawn, you, you talk very eloquently about the problems with doing a bad ravage, but, but what, what makes a good ravage procedure? How can you do it well? Well, the, I mean, the concept of ravage is that you're cutting out something to make it in the right position. Mm -hmm. And the, the problem is that has to heal together. So if you don't preserve pericondrium, or if you take out, especially in the adults, if you take out these huge segments of cartilage, they, they don't heal back together. And you know, that is, you know, you get these patients that have like sternal floating where the whole sternum is detached and they've got these huge, basically hernia holes in their chest wall. I mean, those are huge problems that um, you, you can never bring that person back to normal. I mean, you can plate them and you can use a methyl methacrylate, and, but, but they're never going to be normal. And um, you know, that, that is a big problem, so. And the key in that is, is with the uh, carinatum, because of that, they're calcified and so forth, that perichondrial dissection it is the toughest. And, that, and that's why, like you said, we see a lot of redos and so forth. When you go in there, there's no perichondrium. And so it, it, it's, it's, it's a tough procedure, but you've got to be meticulous, attention to detail to do that. But it is, we don't remove the whole cartilage anymore. We save the, the growth plates at either end, especially in older patients, 30s, 40s, and so forth. So that, but it, it, the key with that is, is just, you know, attention to detail. And stabilization. I, I, I use a lot of titanium plating. If, mm -hmm. if I cut, I usually will stabilize because, uh, like, like you said, especially on the, the kind of the asymmetric and stuff, you almost can't find perichondrium. It's yeah. like this big tree root of mangled, you know, cartilage, and it's very difficult. And so I'll I'll make sure everything things are approximized, made it and stabilized. And say, so, and, and I've gone that to a, a biological standpoint. So I'll I'll stabilize underneath, or I'll stabilize on top, 
And so that, that's, you know, that, that's worked out very well from that. But, but I think, and also too, bring the PECs back together, and that's also in the education. That especially for women, when you come back, you bring the PECs, things are gonna look different for them. And that's why, you know, you might have to have plastic surgery on down the road and so forth, so forth breast augmentation or reconstruction. And it's not every plastic surgeon can do that. You know, they're gonna look and say, oh, you had your pecs removed, you've got bars and plates, fiber wire underneath. So there's special, it's a special team from the beginning to end to, to have a good result. That's the nice thing about the nuts, you don't touch the pecs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You don't need to worry about that. Yeah, that's true. All right. Yeah, and just some final thoughts. I mean, for me, the most difficult patients are things like pectus arcuatum, a big right angle in the chest, or a big, huge, deep scoop chest from top to bottom. I mean, what are the most difficult uh, patients that we should take special attention about? Well, I think the, the arcuatums are very difficult, um, especially when they're high and you know, they're, they're all the way up to man the manubriums involved. You, you end up making two osteotomies in the sternum just to try to get the sternum down. And then often they, they have you know, a significant excavatum which you can, you, you can treat with a ravage, or I actually put a bar once I drop the top down, kind of do a, a balancing procedure. Those are very difficult and um, take a lot of experience. I know when I, know when I serve my practice, I have a much better idea of how to fix those than when, when I first came into practice. Yeah, because that's your manubrial sternal body junction, the angle of Louis, that, that's your universal joint for the chest. So when you're up in that area, you've really got to, like you said, you've got to really modify and look at that. And, and that's the thing about pectus surgery, what's so fascinating when we're in there, we're correcting things. You know, we're, we're like sculptures is what we're doing, is that we're trying to, and it's not like gonna say, oh, that will be okay. Well, when you say that, it's not gonna be okay. So that's why you really got to look at that. You know, I give them a big title volume. I have, you know, even the nurses in the room or, or my techs or PAs, what do y'all think? Well. <laughs> Let's kind of change this a little yeah. bit. It is, because, you know, you leave that room, you don't want to come back. So it's very important to do what's in, in uh, the first time around. Yeah, fabulous. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to both of you. Uh, I think it's so key to go to people with experience uh, and, and absolutely, uh, also, patients really need to come and talk to surgeons about the options, because it's not, surgery is not always the answer, but, but talking about it and, and meeting people like experts like yourself is absolutely key. Well, and I think, too, I think patient support groups. Yes. Because, uh, and, and that is growing throughout the country and so forth. So There's I a think, tremendous amount of online. Uh, um, a lot of chatter. <laughs> well, chatter and, and good stuff, too. Yeah. I mean, the surgeons that are listed, with you know their experience and you know they're the one pectus.com has you know surgeons with reviews from patients and everything else so people can get a pretty good idea mm, absolutely well thank you so much for coming to talk to us at cts net so from myself joel dunning and everyone here i'd just like to say thank you very much thank you thank you joel